Hello and welcome. If you're new to my channel, my name is Christina. And in this week's video, I am super excited to share six fun DIY projects with you. I'm going to talk you through all the supplies and the techniques. This is also a paid promotion included by Cricut. So I've included a couple fun projects using their materials. So let's head over to project one. Having just recently relocated to the city of Victoria in British Columbia, I was really excited to meet with Deb. She is an Annie Salon stockist here in Victoria at Oak Bay. She was super fun. I absolutely adore her shop and I thought it would be a lot of fun if maybe we could paint together. She had received this huge armoire and has been contemplating painting it for quite some time. And she's got fabulous style and she's very artistic. I had suggested, let's try a decoupage onto it. So I brought in two that I thought would absolutely suit this gorgeous armoire. So we conversed which one we thought we would like and then we got started. As you can see, this piece is huge and it actually dominates a lot in the store. So by painting this, we thought this would be a great introductory for when people do come into the store. So we're going to start with some Versailles, which is kind of an off green, a little bit of a gray green. We'll add a little bit of olive, some French linen and a little bit of that dark graphite. And of course, my favorite, some hints of on floor. If you're going to decoupage a piece of furniture, I do recommend that you put down some paint first. And this is because of the transparency of the decoupage paper. It's very similar to that of very fine wrapping paper. And because of that transparency, you definitely want your undercoat to be as light as possible. It was a super fun treat to work alongside with Deb and get to know her and we had a lot of fun. And it was a great way to do something creative even with somebody else. I found that Deb had some great artistic perspectives and this was a great challenge to work together and kind of mash in together what we both thought, how we could actually put this together. The first thing I really wanted to show Deb was the fun of painting with a mash of colors and just having fun, just blending them together and seeing what we can come up with. There's always a way to recreate and restyle, but to get started, let's get the base coat on and try and figure out on a palette level what we wanted. Because we're going to be using the decoupage paper, we want the colors to filter in with that paper. So we're going to go ahead and put that decoupage right into the center of the armoire doors. It's a little bit tricky. So first thing we did is we attached it with some Mod Podge after we marked on the armoire exactly where we wanted it. So by applying the Mod Podge, all we're going to do first is just kind of attack the decoupage on there and then we're going to cut it right down to the center so that way it actually lines up with the doors. The trick with the decoupage is making sure that your Mod Podge is nice and even. And the other major trick, and I've shown in other videos, is making sure that you use a piece of saran wrap to feather it down nice and smoothly. This will also help with the creases and the air bubbles. So once we've got it attached, now we wanna go and actually cut the decoupage. And then we're going to continue with the Mod Podge to adhere the decoupage to the armoire. Because there was a slight lip in the door frame, this really helped when we applied the Mod Podge and continued with the decoupage. I do always recommend to take that little piece of saran wrap and keep rubbing your decoupage. And again, this will help smooth out some of the wrinkles. We decided we actually didn't want to remove all of the wrinkles. We actually kind of liked having a few of the creases. This will actually add to the paint that we'll be applying as we start to paint the decoupage and the armoire in together. And I'll show you that in just a few moments. Again, because this piece was so big, we ended up even having Stella, which is a coworker for Deb at the shop, to come in and help us. So we all got to learn from each other and as well as play around with the paint and really figure out what we wanted to do. 
We also decided to add in a little bit more of the graphite as we wanted it to be a little bit darker on the top as well as a little bit darker on the bottom. So it's really hard to literate exactly where the paint went because what we wanted to do was play with it. And that's what I always recommend when painting a large piece of furniture or even a small piece of furniture. When you're not used to playing with the chalk paints, it's always so much more fun just to go on a whim, just put it on there and just start to play around with it and decide as you go where you want your paints. We allowed that decoupage to kind of mirror out where we were going to have highlights and lowlights with the chosen colors we did. What we want to create is a shadowing effect from that decoupage. What I found really helpful was to add a little bit of the color that I thought would kind of mirror the decoupage, use a little bit of the paintbrush as well as my own fingers to help blend it in. So using that Versailles, which is a gray and a green kind of mixed together, then using a little bit of the olive, a little bit of that dark, dark charcoal graphite color, as well as the little hints of the brown on fleur chalk paint, just seemed to mirror again a lot of what was going on in the colors that were in the decoupage. We really didn't honestly have a plan. We just had a lot of fun just painting away, having a great conversation, and it was just really nice just to be artistic together as well as share ideas and perspectives on what we wanted to do. Again, working on a piece this big, it's good to work in sections, and it's okay. If you've blended something or you've put certain colors down and you don't like it, Chalk paint is so versatile and so easy to work with as a water-based paint, you will have no problem to be able to go back and go over with some added colors on top and continue on until you are happy. What I find really helpful is using a piece of cardboard or if you have a drop cloth, use that as a painter palette. This way you can kind of smash some of the colors that you've chosen, make some new colors and see how they're blending together. When I want to blend and play with a piece this size, you almost have to go back a couple of times. So this entire project, even with three people at it, still took a couple of days. So never feel in a rush. Use it as a therapy, relax, enjoy the process. Where we were going is deciding where we wanted it darker and lighter and where we wanted to make our corrections. So just to demonstrate how easy it is. What I did like to do was just take a few of those little creases that were in the decoupage and lightly, lightly dry brush just what was left on my paintbrush. Because the chalk paint is so thick, it's going to make a bit of texture. And that was exactly what we wanted. We wanted to create texture from the layers that we were building up as we played with it. Now I'm dry brushing a little bit on top of the layers where there's almost like a brush stroke, but they're so random. So this kind of gives it a kind of a crackly feeling between the decoupage and the painted piece now. What we were initially trying to create is a little bit more of an old world fashion for the era of time that something like this was created. Now this was a veneered wood, so it wasn't a thick wood, and it had a lot of bumps and knocks and some scrapes, so painting is a great option. And this certainly doesn't hurt the wood. So if you ever want to go back and go with a wood look with your furniture pieces, you're in the same position as you were when you started. You still have to sand. Chalk paint sits on top of the wood, not inside the pores of the wood. Right now I'm just going around to everything that we've done with the same color palette and adding a little tiny tiny bit of the paint. Little goes a long way. And because the chalk paint does dry quite quickly, sometimes having a little mist spray bottle or water bottle on hand just helps move that paint a little bit. But again, you don't need a lot of paint to blend. That's the main key with blending any paint. A little tiny bit goes a long way. And again, just going around creating highlights and lowlights, recreating some new highlights and lowlights as the colors come together. Then I want to go around and clear wax the entire piece. It will seal it as well as protect your chalk paint. But just to create another decorative accent on top of all this texture we've made, I want to make a color wax just using clear wax 
and the color of Versailles mixed at 50-50. Because I've already clear waxed the piece, by using my color wax on top, this will allow me to create highlights and lowlights where I want them. So if I need to make any correction, I can just take plain clear wax, go back over my color wax and remove it if it's too much. If I need to go back with any clear wax, it's just going to act as an eraser to the color wax. I thought it might be fun to create our own custom style mat with our own signature logo for either the front door or the side door. So to create the logo that I want, I'm actually going to be using my a Cricut Air Explorer 2 with a standard cutting blade. I'm going to start with the Cricut Premium Vinyl. It's removable and you can use any color for this project because I'm going to be using this as part of my stencil. I absolutely love my Cricut Explorer Air 2. I feel like I'm limitless on the amount of things that I can create. Plus all the little standard supplies that they have make everything smooth and easy to use. So we're going to make a 24 inch sheet with that premium vinyl and again we're going to be using the standard grip mat because this mat will actually hold any Cricut project you need to run through the Cricut machine and everything will stay flat and in place as the Cricut makes any cuts in any of your projects. So what we'll do is we will run the vinyl across the grip mat and that's going to hold it in place and then we can jump over to the design space and design exactly a personalized stencil. What I love about the design space website is it is so easy to follow. I just wanted to show you quickly just by a simple click of the button you can pick the font you want, you can pick the size that you want and then once you have your design not only can you save it but you can size it for any project that you're doing. So for this one I want to make it 24 inches. So all I'm going to do is just basically click into the design, the design size that I want. What's super amazing about the design space is you don't have to be tech savvy, you don't have to have a lot of computer knowledge. It is so easy to follow. The design space will also tell you exactly the supplies. It will tell you when to load the supplies into your Cricut machine and it will walk you through the entire process right to the very end. Now that I have my image, my font, I have everything set including my size, all I'm going to do is click in. It's going to tell me to connect my Cricut Air Explorer to my computer and then it's going to tell me when it's cutting. It even tells me when to push start. The flashing C button is the Cricut Start. So we're going to go and let that actually cut onto that vinyl and it's actually even going to tell you how much is completed. The Cricut machine really walks you through all the fine details that make anybody feel creative and be able to design anything you want the way you envision it. Once we remove the premium vinyl from the grip mat, now we have our stencil ready. This is what it looks like once it's completed, but you do have to go around and remove any of the negative vinyl that you don't need as part of your stencil and it's really easy to peel right off. As you can see the materials are very easy to work with and very simple and again making that perfect design exactly the way you want it even into the font size that you want you can really create so much. Now all we need to do is make a transfer so we're going to use a transfer tape. With the transfer tape you're going to place that tape on top of your already cut stencil. This will help it adhere exactly to the mat where we need it before we get into the colors. 
Now I want to show you how the transfer tape works. Now that you've applied the transfer tape on top of your vinyl, now you're going to peel the back of the vinyl off, then remove the transfer tape. This will keep your stencil nice and smooth as well as from tearing or shredding. One little trick I learned though is I'm glad I had a little bit of this original tack glue. Because my font was so small and my mat was not that big, what happened was is my little characters inside my letters from the font that I chose, I found it a little bit helpful just to dab a little tiny bit of glue as it was the mat choice that I had did not have enough for the vinyl pieces to stick on. So this just helped so that way I could have my font completely exactly the way I wanted it before I went ahead and put the paint on. Now because I want to be able to have this mat outside, I'm going to use the Flex Seal and this will stop from leaks and as well as keep it kind of like a liquid rubber. Please use our discount code at heirloom10 in the video and it's also going to be in the video description box below including all the supplies that we've used with our Cricut and Cricut Air Explorer too. This will allow our subscribers to receive 10% off and free shipping on all Cricut machines on Cricut.com through December 31st, 2021. I just bought a little bit of the folk art colors that I needed so that way I could make the subscribe button exactly in the red and to the white that I wanted. But look for the multi-purpose outdoor in the folk art as this would be an outdoor mat. I'm really delighted with the final finish and it's all thanks to my Cricut machine. And thank you Shirley in Georgia for all your wonderful emails and ideas. While I was at the Five Fields Decor and Design with Deb, we decided that we thought it would be fun to stencil a faux-like rug just using plain chalk paint. So we measured out exactly a border of two inches all the way around and how many stencil prints we'll need to give it this kind of faux-like look of there's an area rug, but it's actually a stencil just using plain chalk paint. So we're going to use the graphite chalk paint and just with a hand roller, just going to roll them right on. It's that easy. It's just measuring and putting the location exactly where you want it. I recently had done this a year or so ago on my deck and it lasted, never had any issues. I've also done stenciling on my bathroom floors and again, over five years, I never had any issues with it. All I recommend is to put a lacquer finish on when you're done and you can do it in either the sheen or the matte finish. When Deb originally took over the shop, she actually had painted the floors in the Paloma chalk paint. So that being a couple years ago, we wanted to just give a little fancy update and see how we liked it. With the painter's tape, we taped two inches all the way around so that way we could add another stencil. So Deb had some of Annie Salone's smaller stencils and we added the circle with small stars around all the way around the border. This way we had it perfectly straight just by using the painter's tape and we really, really loved the look when we were done. I want to make a boucle blanket only using my fingers. So I'm going to do a finger crochet. But if you're comfortable, you could use the recommended 12 millimeter crochet hook. But I'm just going to use my fingers as my crochet. 
So first thing I'm going to do is make a slip knot. Pretty easy. Then I'm going to make a row of stitches. So I'm just going to chain on as a sample, just so that way it's easier for the video. I'm going to chain on 10 stitches. So now that I have my chain of 10, first thing I'm going to do is I'm always going to yarn over. So I have my one stitch in my finger, then I'm going to yarn over. Once I've yarned over, I'm going to go into the next stitch. So that's going to have three loops on my finger. First thing you're going to want to do is create an extra stitch, creating the three loops again. Then you're going to remove two loops. Then you're going to remove two loops. Then you're only going to have one loop on your finger. Always remember, yarn over. Go into your next stitch. So I have two. Now I'm going to create three with my working yarn, remove two, then I'm going to remove two again. And this is what they would call a double crochet. So yarn over your finger, always carrying a stitch so you have two. Now what we want to do is make a third stitch. So it looks like I have three, but we need to actually make the third. So now that we have the three, now we're going to remove two. Now we still have two. Take those two. Now we have one. We've almost created these posts when we've done a double crochet like this. But when we get into the next row, I'm going to show you to make sure that for this blanket, how easy it is to continue to finger crochet. So making sure that you yarn over and when you get into your last stitch, it's almost the slip knot. So don't forget to get that last one in. So once we get that stitch in, we have the three hoops. We're going to remove two, then we'll remove two again, and we can carry on to our next row. But the key point with any crochet, even finger crochet, is always add two stitches at the end of each row. Then we can turn our work around. Now that we have our first row, what you'll notice at the top is there's two loops and that's because we did a double crochet but we're only going to go through one and then we can continue on our second row doing the exact same double crochet so always make sure you yarn over and as you can see when we did the additional two stitches at the end before we flipped it over that actually created a stitch I'll show you that again in just a moment. The key is the repetition of the double crochet in using just your fingers. But let's get a little bit more closer here. So again, you're only going to go through that first loop, not the double loop that you've made with your double crochet. So just the first one, yarn over, make a stitch, you have three, remove two, remove two again, yarn over your finger. And this is what it's going to start to look like as it takes some shape. I also want to demonstrate a situation that I had when I first learned to crochet is making sure that you get that last stitch. It's almost off at the side. If you don't, what would happen is the actual blanket will start to kind of fold in and it won't be straight. It'll just kind of curve off into the center. So to keep your borders of your blanket nice and straight, you want to make sure that you're getting that last loop. But because the double crochets are constantly twisting, it's really sometimes a little bit tricky at first. So don't forget those two extra stitches at the end of each row and continue on doing your finger double crochet. So I really want to demonstrate that end stitch again, nice and closely. So this looks like what would be the end stitch, but you have to keep going because if you only do that one, then what will happen is it will start to curve in a little bit. So I'm going to show you my last two stitches. So this looks like the last stitch, but it's not. What you want to do is make sure you're getting that end. So you're almost having to go to the side. Making sure you do that will again keep your borders of your blanket nice and straight. I remember when I first started I made this mistake so many times. So I always stress make sure that you get around that end 
and it's almost at the side. And then you can continue on. And remember, at the end of each row, make sure you add two stitches with your double crochet. This type of yarn is a boucle yarn, and it's actually got a little bit of an irregularity to it. So it's got some thick points to it and some thin points, kind of creating this natural fiber kind of look. When we get to the end of our blanket, I'm going to show you how to cast off. Again, remember those two extra stitches that you make at the end of each row. Now that we're starting another row, you've actually created the first stitch because you're going into the next following stitch starting a new row. Doing that double crochet, we're going to go and I'm going to show you how you've actually created two stitches. Now I'm going into my third stitch. And again, it's because you did that extra two stitches at the end of the row before you flipped it over. This yarn is super soft and it is super textured. It also stitches up very, very quickly. So for each row that I am creating, I am creating almost two inches to the blanket. So it goes along very quickly. When you're ready to start a new ball of the yarn, you're just gonna tie a knot from the new to the old and you can cut off the tails but because this yarn is so bulky, I normally will just leave it, but that's totally up to you. When it's this bulky, you won't really see any of the tails. It just kind of stitches in. So I, that's why I don't bother cutting it off. But if you feel that you want to cut it, don't worry about it. Go ahead and cut those little tails off. But I will show you how to cast off your blanket. So I used a total of six balls of the boucle yarn. The blanket size came in approximately 40 inches by 60 inches, making this a small to medium sized throw blanket. I thought it would be really fun to maybe even add a little bit of fringe to the ends of the blanket. Of course you can use any bulk yarn that you want to do a finger crochet, but it's really that easy. So now that we're going to cast off, I'm just going to do this last stitch, which you can kind of see is a little bit onto the side. Once you have your last stitch and you're only going to have one loop on your finger, you're going to cut off any remainder. Then you're just going to tie a knot and any of the loose tail, you can either cut it off or as I normally do, I just weave it into the blanket. For just a few hours a day for a couple of days, you can have a beautiful boucle throw blanket. So I'm measuring 12 inch strips of the boucle yarn and this way I can go ahead and attach these to the ends of the actual blanket. So going through each stitch, I literally attach it just by creating an even side by side and a knot. It's that easy. It creates a beautiful element for the blanket. So both Deb and I definitely kept busy for a couple of days between painting the armoire and doing the floor. She had found this thrifted frame and had painted it with Versailles. Then what she did is she went around just with white wax and just highlighted all of the high points just straight with white wax. And what she thought would be really nice is to use the other decoupage that we had to create a kind of a wall art. So it worked out perfect. She actually had a piece of plywood that fit the frame and what we'll do is we'll go ahead with the Mod Podge disposable sponge and put that decoupage on top of the plywood. Applying a decoupage that's on a horizontal is a little bit easier than when it's vertical like when we applied it to the armoire. Because we're nice and flat, all we're going to do is evenly distribute the Mod Podge. 
The reason you want it nice and even is because if it's too thick or it's too thin, when we go to press the decoupage, it may not adhere properly. So you want to try to do it as smooth as you can. And again, using that little piece of cling wrap, we're just going to smooth it down so this way it will eliminate the creases as well as, most of all, the air bubbles. I know Deb had a lot of fun with the decoupage and kind of learning the process because she seems to have a lot of experience and knows a little bit more about the image transfer, which I'm really hoping she shows me so I can share that with you in the future. It was a lot of fun to be able to work with somebody with this because these images are quite large. That way somebody can hold it and then the other person can also smooth it out. So this kept it from wrinkling very, very easily. Big or small, I always stress to work in small sections when working with decoupage. You also have a little bit of working time with that Mod Podge, so if you need to actually pull up your transfer, just do it really slowly, just in case there was a crease that you want to remove, just to replace your decoupage paper. We also had to improvise a little bit because the decoupage was a little bit shorter than the actual plywood, which also fit the size of the frame. So there was gonna be a little bit of a gap at the bottom. So we decided that, hey, let's get a little bit crafty with the chalk paint and see if we could kind of mirror some of the same colors and textures going on with the actual decoupage painting colors and see if we can kind of blend it in there so you wouldn't notice that it was had a gap at the bottom. So we wanted to gauge how much of the plywood was still remaining and kind of measure that out and then go ahead and grab some of the paints that we will need in the same kind of color match. If you don't have chalk paints, you can always use acrylic paints and other paints that you may already have. The other thing I had noted too, when we put it onto the plywood, because there's little pockets into the wood, I noticed that the sides didn't adhere quite as quickly and as firmly as I wanted. So just use a tiny little brush or even a Q-tip. So if you notice any little air pockets on the side, just grab a little bit of Mod Podge, rub it in there, and then go back over with your cling wrap to smooth it out. Now we're gonna use a little bit of the Enfleur, which is that brown chalk paint. We found some yellow in the Arles chalk paint. And now we're just gonna play and blend and just try to go with the flow of what the decoupage painting has, just so that way we can, we could recreate an illusion of the painting kind of continuing to hide that little bit of the plywood even decided to add tiny little hints of graphite and again don't be afraid to use your fingers because of giving the same kind of a brush stroke kind of look to the old oil painting look that the decoupage has hear the birds and see the sun side by side our fears are done all the good times just begun Hold on tight Found what we're looking for in life Call us crazy But things are finally right So I'm super excited to announce that the Annie Salone chalk paint team in Oxford had reached out to me with their new launch of 32 colors of wall paint. And because I'm gonna be doing lots of room makeovers, including closets and bathrooms, I was just thrilled to see this gorgeous palette of wall chalk paint. So I'm really looking forward to sharing all kinds of fun makeover and designs with you soon. I'm also super excited to be part of a chalk paint challenge. And I found this a little tiny little chest of drawers and what it is is we are challenging a few painters from across the globe to a challenge of a certain color palette that any saloon will choose and what we're going to do is only be able to use those chalk paint colors so i'm going to share that entire process with you shortly in an upcoming video
So my husband and I really thought it would be a great idea to make soap. And we wanted to use our Cricut Air Explorer 2 and just with a standard cutting blade to make our soap labels. I'm going to be using the Cricut cardstock in the neutral sample. I'm also going to be using the printable sticker paper. I'm just heading over to the Cricut design space, just showing you how you can just type in whatever label that you want to use, wording, you can pick your own fonts. It's really easy to follow. You can even choose your own colors and it's going to help you size it. It is an easy, easy process to use on the Cricut design space. I am not that technical savvy, so I can really appreciate how simple and a simple format that the Cricut Design Space has made for you to be able to follow. I now can also cut and copy because I want to make enough labels for all the soap that we're about to make. So once I have everything set and copied and ready to go, then the Cricut's going to tell me exactly what I'm going to need inside my Cricut machine to go ahead and process and push go. I'm going to go ahead and print these off when I finish the soap. So let's head over and let's start making some soap. So I purchased this five pound container of soap and it's in the goat's milk so it's nice and natural, easy, really soft and comfortable to use. I'm not going to use five pounds to start. I think I'll start with half of that. So we'll go ahead and just cut that right in half. All the supplies that I'm going to be using both for the Cricut as well as the soap supply and all the other supplies that I've used in my video will be found in the description box below. What we're going to do is work with the two and a half pounds of the goat's milk soap but to get it to the consistency we need, we're going to have to melt it. So what we'll do first is cut it into small cubes. This was actually a very clean and fun smelling project to do. Once Ryan and I had all the cubes cut up, we're going to use a microwavable friendly container and we're going to go and melt this. And it was recommended to use 30 second intervals. So melt it for 30 seconds, stop it, put it back on for 30 seconds and continue to do that process until it was completely melted. Because the microwave is kind of an uneven cook, it'll almost cook the outside before it cooks the inside. That's why it's recommended to do the 30 seconds, let it stop. We repeated the 30 seconds approximately five times and then everything was completely melted. Once we had the goat's milk soap completely melted, then we're gonna go ahead and add some fun elements and natural elements like some dried flowers as well as honey almond fragrance. Because it was the first time we've ever actually physically made our own soap, we decided to just kind of go light and easy and just add a little bit here and there, not too much. So we only added in about two thirds of the bottle of the honey and almond scent. This little kit, which is a soap cutting kit, I actually purchased this at the Michaels Craft. You can probably find it in Hobby Lobby in the US as well. And this way I can cut the soap bars in an exact of the way I want. You can use a straight blade or a charaded blade. Stir everything up really well and then go ahead and pour your ready mix soap into the mold. Then what you're going to do is you're going to let it sit. What we did note is there was a few little air bubbles on the top of the soap. To remove the air bubbles that come to the top is really easy. Just use a small little spritz bottle with a little tiny bit of the rubbing alcohol and just give a light little spray, maybe three or four times at the top, let that sit. Then we'll go ahead and we'll put the soap mold in the fridge and we're gonna let this sit overnight. Now that the soap is now completely formed again, we're going to take it out of the mold and go ahead and put it into the cutter. And I wanna make them fairly thick 
approximately two inches in thickness. Pretty easy to remove the inside mold. It comes right off, no troubles at all. And now we're gonna go ahead and cut those into those two inch bars. So we ended up making 12 bars of soap with the honey and almond scent and the natural dry flowers. And I was actually really surprised how well they turned out. And it was a lot of fun. So this will be a great gift idea. So now I can finish my labels with my Cricut cutter and my Cricut labels. But what I did decide is I didn't want the red font. I decided to change that. Again, please use our Heirloom 10 code. This will allow you as subscribers to receive 10% off and free shipping on all Cricut machines on Cricut.com through now until December 31st. Using the cardstock and the neutral sampler, I'm gonna make strips of one and a half inch because the soap bars are two inches. My printable sticker paper, I wanna make sure that my cuts will be also in one and a half inch to go on top of that label. But as I say, I've decided to change my mind from the red to go to this kind of a terracotta orange. I thought it would match into the soap, considering the soap flower colors that we used. What was really helpful is that my original design was already saved on my Cricut Design Space. So when I went back to make my changes, it was super easy. Thank you so much for watching this week's video and please if you haven't already hit the subscribe button and notification bell that's going to tell you when i upload my next video if you have any questions and or comments leave me a comment in the comment box below and all the supplies and the materials i've used for the video will be found in the description box below until then take care i'm really looking forward to seeing you soon are you looking forward to seeing me i'm looking forward to seeing you soon are you doing the outro? Are you going to say goodbye until next week? Or you just want to go out for a walk? You just want to go out for a walk. He just wants to go out for a walk. You want to say goodbye? You want to say goodbye? <laughs>